School committee started at seven and entered executive session for uh, talking about collective bargaining. Now we are returned to open session. First order of business would be superintendent's report. Good. Thanks, John. Uh, there are a number of student awards. Uh, I'd ask Pat to uh, mention those for the public: uh, art awards and also music awards. All the awards held in the fine performing arts. Uh, the first list is 28th, 7th, and 8th grade students from Chenery and 14 9th grade students from Belmont High School who are accepted for participation in the Mass Music Educators Association Eastern District Junior High Musical Festival. For Chenery Middle School for band, uh, Adam Beldashi, Paul Green, Alex Griffin, Anand uh, Katagata, Brian Liddell, Crystal Mambro, Andrew Slap. Emma Teach and Linda Way for Mixed Chorus, Katie Fallon, Robbie Gibson, and Robert Stafford. For Treble Chorus, Rosie Barada, Maggie Davis, Sienna Haynes, Elizabeth Harrison, and Rachel Polanski. For Orchestra, Najet Abuhadi, Thad Carlisle, Anchi Cheng, Zandro Ho, John Lazenby, Rebecca McGinnis, Sinju Sasunumu, Yu Yi Yun Sung, Allison Wong, Ben Wolfman, and George Zhang. From the high school for band, Aiden Kerry Benson, Leo's Boren. For mixed chorus, Ayana Coleman Potempo, Emily Guthrie, Leah Levy, Christiana Massey. For treble chorus, Caroline Chobanian and Rebecca Hillel. For orchestra, Nora Bent, Gabriella Grimaldi, Ben Meyer, Sam Woodlock Moore. And for jazz ensemble, Ross Hall and Nathan Woolman. Is another list of 11 students from Belmont High School who've been selected to uh, participate in the MMEA All-State Music Festival. And those students are in band, Karen Akasaka, Jenny Kang, Narissa Gogos, Nathaniel Meyer, and for chorus, Isabella Gamble, Gabrielle Campagnoni, Jackson Lowry, Askier Nielsen, Jacob Sharfman, and for orchestra, Jerwei Chang and Anna Stromer. And lastly, for um, announcement for students in the arts, the Boston Globe Scholastic Art Competition results are in. And um, we had a number of students from grades 7 through 12 who participated in and submitted artwork in the area of painting, portfolio, uh, ceramics, and photography. And uh, the students who uh, received awards were first uh, Olivia Buck, uh, Pet Classification Painting, won a Gold Key Award. George Coffin won an American Vision Award for painting and a gold key for portfolio. And the American Vision Award is uh, granted to only one of five students in the state. So this is really a rather prestigious award for George. And if you, uh, his lovely interview and, his, and the picture that he did in the Boston Globe for February 10th. I'm sure it's still online, but I can pass it around so you can see what, what he did. Uh, Sarah Fennell uh, earned a silver key for photography. Lee Wen Hu uh, received a gold key for painting and a gold key for her portfolio. Allison um, Ayuda Kony for photography won a silver key. Sahar Kashi for painting won a gold key. Julianne Lee for her portfolio won a gold key. Sean Mahoney a silver key for photography and a gold key for a portfolio in photography. Catherine Rausch an honorable mention in ceramics. And Yuli Song a gold key for her portfolio in photography, and Rose Wu, a gold key for painting. There are close to 4,000 individual students and over 350 schools that participate in this competition. So I think the, uh, the Belmont High School uh, students uh, really performed rather well, and I especially congratulate those students. Congratulate also uh, all the teachers, especially Mark Malowski, who really works closely with the teachers yes. and does such a, I mean, with the students and does such a, a terrific job. Mark is an outstanding uh, teacher and uh, a real leader in terms of that, uh, that department. There are a number of events coming up in the next few weeks, uh, next, uh, actually, a uh, month and a half. Uh, a number of us are going down to the Mass School Building Authority on Thursday, uh, 1 o'clock, to present our case for why the Wellington School uh, uh, definitely needs to be funded for a new building. Uh, I'm going to ask at the end of our session here to Jerry to say a few words about Wellington and some of the heat issues we've had because that has been an issue in the last couple of days. In fact, Wellington was not in school today because of that. 
Uh, Diversity Week at Belmont High School is February 25th to the uh, 29th. It's the week that we come back after Vacation Week. A terrific program has been put together. Uh, Dan Richards and the students have worked on this. Uh, I will give you a copy of this. I just got this tonight from Pat, so I'll get a copy of this and get it to you uh, as soon as possible. We have a health and wellness fair March 12th at Belmont High School. Uh, Rosemary Peterson has put this together, a terrific program. Uh, I recall going to this two or three years ago, and it was just great. So if you get a chance to come in and see it, it's between 9 and 1 in the field house at Belmont High School. A very, very wonderful program. Dr. Arlando, do all high school students go there as part of their science class? Yeah, I think they do. Right. That's right. Scott, thank you for uh, putting that out. It's uh, <coughs> a, a number of uh, uh, folks giving information as, and, uh, and then some other uh, some demonstrations and things like that really good. Uh, kindergarten information night, March 27th at the Wellington School. Uh, Pat and the elementary principals uh, and a number of teachers uh, will be uh, presenting that night. The Foundation for Belmont Education, a spring reception and live auction April 5th uh, at the uh, uh, Hellenic Cultural Center uh, in Watertown. And that's uh, it's called Technology for Tools for Teaching. And they're really working hard on uh, uh, having a uh, um, you know, a, a number of uh, uh, kinds of support for the school in the area of technology, presenting that and then working with Lee and with the uh, curriculum directors and uh, the administrators on that. So this should really be a, a lovely evening as it always is. And then finally, uh, Florence Cooperstein called me and said that uh, Belmont High School uh, reception for parents of alumni of Belmont High will be held in Belmont High School April 12th, Saturday night, 6.30 to 10. And they have some uh, appetizers and desserts, and it's a chance for parents to get together whose children have graduated from Belmont High, in many cases gone to outside the area or the different parts of the country. And uh, uh, Florence and a number of the parents pulled us together. It's always a, a terrific evening. So uh, not that I've been, because it's always been a conflict with something else. But uh, uh, she always uh, pulls it together and always keeps me uh, well informed on it. So I promised Florence I would uh, give it a couple of pitches. So that's my <laughs> first pitch, and I'll do it again. Uh, and then, as I promised you, a number of issues on the Wellington uh, School uh, regarding the heat uh, or lack thereof. And I've asked Jerry to uh, address those issues. Jerry. Thank you. Uh, the past two days, we've had some difficulty with heat at the Wellington. It started Sunday night, Monday morning, with the extreme cold temperatures and the high wind. The boilers, both boilers went out. And for a while, there was no heat in the building at all. Uh, this was detected early, and our maintenance crew, Bob Martin, got in there at 7.30, called our contractor. The boilers were fired back up at 7.30. They had a good hour to get heat up to make it at least somewhat minimally acceptable for students to be in the building. And we knew we were going in the right direction, so we decided to hold school that day. The only part of the building that was a particular problem uh, on Monday was when the heat was coming back up, there was a classroom on the second floor. By second, I always mean top floor. I go ground for a second. Um, on the Orchard Street side, about halfway down, where uh, Univent, actually as the hot water came back into the pipe in the Univent, a Univent sprung a leak, which not only created a problem in that room, but also stopped the heat from going into the Univents in the three rooms beyond that point. So we had four cold rooms, but because it was only four, Amy Wagner was able to move those classes to other parts of the building, the cafeteria, the IMC, other rooms, and got through the day. And by mid to late morning, most of the rooms were up to a very comfortable temperature. I went over there, and most of the teachers at that point, the kids were taking their coats off and having a normal day. However, because of that Monday incident, there was a carryover effect till Tuesday morning. Uh, unbeknownst to us that when the heat was off on Monday, there was a rooftop unit on top of the maintenance garage, which is at the far end of the Orchard Street wing, which provides the ventilation for the ground floor. It takes the hot water from the same boiler that feeds the top two floors. One of the pipes in that unit froze during the cold weather. And when, on Monday, the hot water was pushed back into the pipes for that unit, it actually caused the pipe to burst. Now, the leaking from that went right into the maintenance garage, which was not an issue. 
but it also then drained the pressure in the entire hot water system for the three stories in the Orchard Street wing, causing heat to be shut off in the entire Orchard Street wing. We still had heat going into the other portion of the building, the gymnasium, cafeteria, and music room. So we had no choice but to cancel school today because we knew that that problem could not be corrected in time to bring the heat up into the building and because it affected every classroom on the Orchard Street wing, there's no choice in the matter. Uh, we got very good cooperation. Um, we used the telephone distribution system to get a recorded message out to, I believe, all parents or most parents. Uh, there's a very high percentage participation in that. We also did the normal notifying the uh, TV stations and Amy Wagner actually started the room phone chains to make sure that nobody was missed. Um, our maintenance crew went in and started repairing that, plus our contractor went in and put a new valve in for to isolate the rooftop unit. Once that was isolated, our maintenance crew was able to push hot water back into the rest of the building. Uh, had to go through each room, each level, bleed air out of the lines. By midday, the entire first floor was warm and they were working on the second floor. I didn't go back over there a second time, but I'm sure by the end of the day, from what Amy said, the building was warm again. And the outside contractor is repairing the broken pipe in the rooftop unit on the maintenance garage. So we do think, without any further incidents, we will be in shape to open school at the Wellington tomorrow morning and barring a snowstorm. That might close us all. I really want to thank Jerry and Bob Martin, who have uh, done tremendous work in terms of uh, addressing this issue. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think we're handling this as well as possible. Um, the, uh, it's, you know, the shape of the building is not good, and uh, it's getting worse. And uh, clearly this will be an issue we'll talk about with the MSBA on Thursday. Right. And we've had, I've had several conversations with uh, Cassie Norton from the Citizen Herald, and there will be an article in tomorrow's paper on, on all these two events and the event of last week, even triple header, hat trick. You might say. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. That's everything. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Next item is the chairman's report. Uh, a couple quick items. This past Saturday was the Foundation for Belmont Education Spelling Bee. Four hundred and thirty students participated. Was a record, and uh, it was. I guess half of us at this table had kids. Spelling. It was a lot of fun. Uh, March 1st is the big power between us, the selectmen, and the uh, foreign committee, or at least the education subcommittee of the library. In this room, uh, we go on at 10 o'clock. Minuteman is either 9 15 or 9 30. 9 15. 9 15. Yeah, but I would, I would not assume that Minuteman is going to take a full 45 but, um, So, plan accordingly. Um, I'm going to be here at 9 because uh, it starts at 9 for another department. If you come in you, you'll see the riveting human resources conversation. Don't know. The note was not really something you're supposed to read. Yeah, I just want to read the time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the whole ankle is up. Okay. Um, MASC Day on the Hill is April something like 5th, uh, which some of us have gone to in previous years. That's uh, a meeting with this representatives from the state legislature to, to air the MESC's concerns for education. It's, um, it's always educational. I've gone twice, and it's kind of, kind of fun to get together with other school committee members. Nice lunch at the State House. And, um, What's the date again? I'm not sure. I think it's Saturday. I was thinking the 8th or something like that. I think this is Saturday. I'll, I'll come up with the real date, but it's uh, now to us. And that's all I have. Go to the first major order. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. citizens' concerns. Oh, all right. Are there any citizens' concerns? Why does it don't appear on the agenda? Why does it don't appear on the agenda? Ms. Mann, please introduce yourself. Uh, Ann Mann, Foreign Committee Observer. Uh, I'm just wondering. You know, this is not the Warren Committee. I <laughs> <laughs> The additional expenses from the outside contractor to fix the heating system, does that come out of the school budget? Yes. It's not under town maintenance. No, it's okay. We fix our buildings. Right. And we're okay with that? I mean, we have enough. So far. <laughs> so far. Yes, okay. we do. 
later on we'll be covering yeah. that portion of the budget and I'll comment on the relative expenses of the law and versus other schools. Thank you. Yeah, actually, if we, when the new Wellington is built, one of the net losers in this will, in fact, be the folks at Bedford Mechanical. <laughs> I think 70% of the money they charge to Belmont probably comes, you know, uh, as a result of the one deal, and 25% of it comes from the high school. Dr. Missile has been on record as saying, whenever he sees that Bedford Mechanical truck coming to town, he says it's going to cost us money. So do they have a vote for the one? No. <laughs> exclusion? Well, we should be vigilant, okay? okay. Um, the other system concerns, I guess not. Next item is major business. Continued discussion of the FY09 budget. This is our uh, third session of uh, uh, reviewing the budget in more detail, and uh, uh, Jerry will uh, lead us through this uh, section as he has the other two. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to note that Bob Martin had planned to come tonight because we're going to be covering the custodial and buildings and grounds portions, but I told him to take the night off since he was up early this morning and he plans to be up early tomorrow morning because of the impending storm to check on road conditions. So if you have any tough questions, I can either try to answer them or get back to you. We're going to start on page 26 within the budget page of the description and development and go straight to page by page to the end of the budget book in terms of the budget pages. Page 26, and also I should mention for anybody in the audience who does not have their own budget book, everything we plan to cover tonight is going to be <coughs> package of those that are on the table, starting with page 26. Um, page 26 is curriculum development, and as we've always done in the past, the curriculum development salary line is half of the assistant superintendent salary, and that's only because, according to the DOE guidelines, that we can claim the assistant superintendent salary for professional <coughs> development. So it's always been split between curriculum development and staff development. There used to be a mandated amount that you had to spend on professional development. Now it's kind of suggested, and the DOE does say count your assistant superintendent as part of that calculation. Um, we're level funding the summer workshop salary and we're level funding the supplies on that page. I'll continue right on to staff development and take questions on either. Staff development on the next page, 27, is the other half of the assistant superintendent salary and we also split the assistant superintendent secretary, uh, Pauline Sullivan, between these two pages. Um, the mentor stipends, we're budgeting $31,750. That's for a projected 35 mentors at a contractual amount of $850 per, plus men mentor liaison at $2,000. I should note that in the non salary accounts, the uh, staff development programs and conferences, uh, Dr. Robin very uh, gallantly is told us that she would decrease that account in order to keep the bottom line of the budget within a reasonable amount from $50,000 to $40,000. The staff development tuition reimbursement account of $50,000 is required by the teacher's contract. It's required that we budget it at that amount, whether it's fully spent or not. Excuse me, John, can I okay. uh, What are the mentors? Pat, you want to describe what the mentors do? Mentors who mentor are new teachers. Oh, okay, so they're more experienced teachers mentoring people too. So it's not right. a contract, it's just inside. Right. But it's $850 per mentor. The amount they get paid is in the unit A contract. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, all the other, the EMI membership dropped down to zero because we realized at one point that we had that double budget between this and the Medco grant. So we took it out of here, left it in a Medco grant. Uh, all the other accounts in the non-salary are basically level funded. Any questions on either curriculum development or staff development? Staff development. Go ahead. Staff development acknowledgement from 12,000 to zero? Is that because the training is completed? Or? No, the technology line is 10 level funded EMI at 10 to 10. That's the EMI. That's the one that we realized was double budgeted. So we. We are covering that in the, out of the medical grant. Thanks. Just curious, back then, curriculum development supplies, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Missile, um, the expenditure in 07 was a little more than a third of the budget of $3,000, and you get us gone up to $4,000 for 
for uh, budget the, the, the subsequent years. Um, so it's level funded for this year, but um, was that expenditure actual on 07 an anomaly? Was it? Are we actually spending closer to this 4,000 now on an annualized basis than the, than the, just you know, kind of a big percentage increase? It, 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 it's it's hard to hard to know uh, what what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Depends on who we who we bring in, program okay. needs, materials that we purchase for teachers. So okay. Well, it's level funded from FY08 to FY09, but I'm right. just curious because of the only actual figure here is about about a third of what had been in that right. budget. When we put a budget freeze on, this is one account that Dr. Albee freezes until we basically see uh, what it looks like in the spring. And then at that point, it's beyond the point where we can use it creatively. Do we, do we ever uh, come close to using the entire <coughs> tuition reimbursement <coughs> budget? Past five or ten years, or is it always way under? The actual always way. It's under been under. I wouldn't call it way under. I don't have the previous figures. Um, it hasn't ever hit the max of fifty thousand. Let's put it that way. But we're still required by contract to budget at fifty thousand. Yeah. We have a. It's not an unrealistic ceiling at this point because we have a larger number every year of younger teachers on our staff who are looking to take additional courses. Some of them are required to take courses for permanent certification. So would our staff distribution change dramatically over the past five years from a very senior staff, many of whom have now retired, to very young staff? This is an account I do expect to go up every year. Yep, thanks. Anybody else? Thanks, okay. Moving on. We have the substitute page. And I do the format and substitute page a little bit different because there's no in-house staffing. So I'm basically showing you on the page 28.1, uh, three previous years' budget and three previous years' expenditure. We'll level funding the budget for the second consecutive year. There's a great deal of fluctuation in this budget, and it's in the line for long-term subs. You look back to FY05, and we expended $200,000 in that line. The following year, FY06 de decreased by half to 96000 and it's been low since then, and hopefully it will stay low. One reason that it's fluctuating so greatly is, again, the long-term subs is tied into the younger staff. Most of the long-term subs are for maternity leaves, and with the younger staff, we are having more young teachers going out on maternity. So we're fortunate to be able to level fund it uh, the following page, 28.2, we've been using this sense of looking at the expenditure for the previous years and taking the average either of the previous three years or the average of the previous two years. And the 255 is very close to the average of the previous three years, so we'll stay with that for the time being. Can you tell me how much a long-term sub costs, like where on the salary scale that would fall for the equivalent amount of money? Could either one of the so long term subs, if, if they're in for a. a right, but where would. I mean, the amount of money a long term sub would cost for an entire school year. Same as, as a step of. Uh, that if they were coming in as a teacher. Okay. All right. So it's a, just a different account. Mm -hmm. It depends on the length of the time, length of time, right? Yeah. They have to be there, uh, what, 60, 60 days, days or more. And then, then they go up to the thing. That, otherwise, the substitute pays about 75 a day. but. If they go up to the regular schedule, it's considerably higher than that. You should also be aware of the way we handle the payroll on this. When a long-term sub comes in while the teacher's on maternity leave and drawing sick leave, we charge a long-term sub to the substitute account. If the teacher stays out on unpaid leave beyond her maternity leave, we then transfer the payment to long-term sub to the department or program or school that she's subbing for. So the sub account is only getting hit for the period of time where we actually have double payments, one in terms of sick leave to the teacher that's out, and then the sub who's filling her, her position. So. Uh, I'm just curious why on the uh, long-term sub and the daily sub, it, it's, it's level, you've switched just 10,000, up 10,000 on daily, and down 10,000 on Basically long -term. because I was looking at the expenditure on the daily sub account for the 
previous couple of years and saw it climbing. The expenditure for our daily subs in 07 was 130,000, so I thought I would match that in the budget. And I was still over our last two years' expenditure for long term. Just trying to realign those. One last question. Do, do we have any idea at this point um, how much money um, is saved in the substitute account by the high school's policy of not getting a, a one day one day subs in? I mean, that was under the Foster Wright Institute, right. I'm thinking like six, seven years ago. And I mean, obviously it's a, it's a mixed blessing in that there is a, some kind of financial saving, but there's also an, an awful lot Cost. of, as, as you know, with students wanting to go to high school, you know, hither and yon, uh, because of freeze anyway, when, when substitutes, you know, don't make it and, and children are told, you know, you don't have a class that day, uh, there's also another kind of price to be paid as far as the overall effectiveness of the instruction. Well, we could estimate it, though, Scott. I mean, I, not, I don't think right now, but we, what we could do is sort of work on the number of uh, teachers there are and then try to maybe use a comparable size school like the middle school and calculate what that would be. Yeah, I, I, I'd just be curious because it, it is it's something that, that, that keeps our, our budget uh, reduced to a certain amount, but it, it comes at a price, again, in terms of uh, the, the instructional effectiveness of the high school. So no further questions, I'll move on to transportation on page 29.1. I want to note that the transportation contract that we have now is ending at the end of this current year. Uh, I'll be putting out a bid. Sorry, was there a question? Is there a question at that last section? Ms. Graham? Raise your hand a little higher next time. Uh, yeah, I have a question that follows on what I was talking about. What's the impact um, at the high school when there aren't substitutes for kids who have um, an IEP with a service board? I mean, that's a lack of compliance of providing kids with services. You don't have an OT or a PT or a teacher who's providing services. I'll check on that. Yeah. But I'm, yeah. Well. I'll check on that. But I, I would have to imagine that if it is uh, required by an, uh, an ed plan that the services are provided perhaps by a substitute or perhaps by another one of the teachers in the department? That's, a, that's exactly what it is I think have, is that when a special ed teacher is absent, there is a substitute for that, for that teacher. But then that brings in the question of, is it a substitute who has been trained in that service and that's in that? Exactly. Can answer that? Just one. Thank you. Transportation? No. I mean, if anybody else have uh, questions, feel free to interrupt. On the, our contract is ending, so basically I built in a flat 10% increase. Um, we don't know if that'll be realistic or not, but we'll, from my sense of other districts, that's probably in a ballpark. And in anticipation of implementing full day kindergarten, we have taken out the cost of the kindergarten buses out of the regular day line. That having been said, I want to correct one error in the footnote, where in the first footnote, the, sec the third sentence I have, we are eliminating the two midday kindergarten buses for a projected savings of $210,570. I wish. <laughs> There's a typo in there. It should be $20,570. I know. That would have almost paid for full day yeah. K by itself. <laughs> <laughs> Two very expensive gold plated buses there. <laughs> so that is the savings that we took out. Uh, our current kindergarten buses on this third year contract uh, is costing us $18,700. When I projected an increase in that at 10%, it came to 20570 So if we do not implement full day K, we will have to return to this line and budget either to 20570 or maybe by that point we'll have the bids in and know an actual number. We are also anticipating a 10% increase in the bus fee to keep the proportion between uh, the school contribution and the fee contribution to roughly the same. Um, actually, without the kindergarten bus, the school contribution will drop slightly to 43%, where the fee contribution will increase to 57%. The Volk Tech Transportation, uh, it's a line we've had, it wasn't funded for this year because there was no need for it. We are funding it for next year because we have one student who is attending uh, Norfolk Aggie School in Walpole, and by state law, 
we are responsible for the transportation for that student as well as the tuition. What year is he in? What year is he in? Sophomore this year. So we have him for two more years. Okay. Any questions on transportation? Sure. For districts that charge students who are not required to be bused, are we subsidizing about the same fraction of the cost as other districts? I'd have to check on that. Just curious. I know we can, I mean, the MESC gives us, uh, you know, yeah. somebody a com comparison of overall fees. I'm just wondering whether we subsidize by the same percentage. Right. I'll have to look into that. I haven't had the chance. Um, I mean, only 16% of our students are required to be bus with no fee. Eighty-four percent of our riders either pay the fee, hit the family max, or are waived, have the fee waived because of low-income requirements. Um, so most of our riders are fee-based. How about the Minuteman bus? Isn't there public uh, school-sponsored transportation Minuteman? Oh, we don't pay that. That's built into the Minuteman assessment back to the town. Thanks. The budget we had back in 07, without an expenditure, was a leftover program where for one year we were sending students on an af afternoon basis from Belmont High School to Minuteman. Uh, the previous high school principal, Mr. Dr. Landman, was had that as a pilot program but did not continue it because uh, just not enough interest. So we had a budget for 07, but then the program was not used and nothing was expended. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Just an observation that um, uh, we'll, we'll get to the revolving accounts, but since this one, this is one of the uh, accounts that interacts with the revolving account, I uh, just wanted to note that for the last three fiscal years, including the projected one, uh, this has been basically for budgeting purposes uh, of funds in, funds out. We're, we're neither spending down a, a large increase, nor are we budgeting a large revolving fund amount, nor are we trying to build up a revolving fund account. Um, if this budget goes through with projected balances to the end of the fiscal year, um, the amount of sort of surplus on hand will be one, two, three, four, roughly 25% of the total annual expenditure um, in, in this account, um, $44,000. Uh, um, so this, this is not one of the revolving accounts from which we'll be seeing any real infusion of money into the budget, although there are some others that we'll be getting into later tonight, and those will not be sustainable. Those are basically one-time um, savings to the operating budget, which we'll have to replace with other means in subsequent years. And I will return to the school committee later this spring with a recommendation on increasing the fee here, but I would rather actually wait until I get bids open mm -hmm. to see what the real cost was. It will be in the vicinity of 10% if the bid price would go up 10%. Okay, thanks. That finishes that major section. We're over into the operations services budget, starting on page 31 with uh, buildings and grounds. This is a budget that I gave you the replacement page for, which is 31.3. We had started off requesting about $700,000 in contracted services and non-salary for this budget, and then as we went through our central office deliberations, we decided to level fund it along with supplies and textbooks and equipment. Only I failed to go back and correct page 31.3, so you now have it. And you can see where the roughly $200,000 worth of reductions came from. I won't go through this school by school unless you have specific questions. I'm sorry, we'll make one comment. The first two non-salary lines are new lines because of DOE reporting requirements on the end of year report. Uh, they ask us to actually track what we spend on security systems, and we're requesting $24,000 in the contract and services for next year. And this is also 24,000 listed under the general repair pages for the details. And that's to provide interior door locks on all four elementary schools. We ran into an issue when we tried to do lockdowns and realized that most of our elementary schools do not have locks on the interior classroom doors. So the lockdowns would have to be a pretend lockdown. They're going to be nice and high. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good suggestion. I'm thinking about my brother and I. <laughs> and this is this is not part of uh, 
the hundred and fifty thousand dollar request to the capital no, budget bill? No, that's outside security in terms of getting into the building. This is basically just okay. inside security, so we could conduct lockdowns at all six of our all six of our schools. Right now, we can only conduct them thoroughly for real at the middle school and high school. <coughs> Would this legitimately be? Could it be legitimately a capital budget request since it's you know one item twenty four thousand dollars and good for ten or twenty years? Uh, we could add it to the hundred fifty thousand, so that we are asking the capital budget committee. But the capital budget committee probably has many more requests than they could handle. Well, and it, and it also probably falls under the category of batching things. You know, it's not one lot that costs twenty four thousand dollars. It's a bunch of lots that cost. And I'm just telling you the conversations we've had about various other you can things. You the same thing about security cameras, too. Well, but, you know, the same thing has been said about some audiovisual equipment that, you know, that together may come to, you know, $15,000, but individually isn't. I, you know, I think, I think all that we can certainly put it on the list. My guess is that it would be, I, I'm, I'm, I'm mind reading a little bit, but my guess is that it would probably be put back as, you know, small individual things that, should be paid for out of this budget, but I could be wrong. Yeah. I was one. But you were mistaken. <laughs> I was mistaken. You were <laughs> Every one of these schools start off with a, an account called general repair, and most of the most of the schools is the largest allocation of money. The details of that is found further on on pages 31.4, where you have the entire list of what was requested by either the principals or Bob Martin in terms of the infrastructure. Uh, the principals and Bob's priorities given to that, and then what was cut out and leaving the items that were funded. So if you basically ever want to get a picture of what we're not doing because of budget constraints, you can look at the column that says superintendent's recommended budget and any cell that has no number in it is something that was requested, is legitimately needed, but is not going to get done next year. And you can see that that list was whittled down from $362,500 to only $190,000, only slightly more than half of the request. Uh, this is where, you know, we feel we just can't do everything we need to do or where we're stretching the budget the way it is. Um, the bonus sheet I passed out tonight also relates to this. This is a sheet that we're preparing for our MSBA visit on Thursday, where we looked at the actual maintenance expenditure for the Wellington School for the past 10 years and compared it with the Windbrook School, which has comparable enrollment. And we find that over the past 10 years, we spent an average of $53,000 a year in maintenance at the Wellington and an average of only $36,000 a year at the Windbrook, 45% uh, higher at the Wellington. And we will continue to, the bills from this past two weeks are part of what will be a very expensive maintenance year at the Wellington. We will spend it, whether it's over budget or not. Um, over the 10 years total, we spent close to $200,000 more at the Wellington than we had at the Winbrook for a comparable number of students. We're also preparing for the MSBA a comparable comparison on utility cost, which will show that our utility cost at the Wellington is 35% higher per pupil than they are at the Winbrook. We hope that this will give us convincing arguments with the MSBA to build a new school. Um, I'll take questions on any of the buildings and grounds. The, any of the pages, there's numerous pages there. Here's a question on 31.4, one of two under Wellington. The uh, request was for $30,000 to move the main office to the lower IMC. And I seem to recall when we had a presentation last spring from the security folks that Wellington was the one office where you couldn't see any of the doors. Was that the reason for the request? There's actually the several elementary schools where you can see the doors. I mean, the Burbank. Mm -hmm. You can see the front door, but the entrance off the parking lot is on a whole different floor. Right, right. The Butler has somewhat of a view. The Windbrook is probably the best of all yeah. in terms of control. Uh, if we were keeping the Wellington long term, 
that would have received a higher priority. But we felt that we couldn't justify an expenditure of $30,000 for hopefully one more year of occupancy. Um, could I just try to answer that question a little? It did come up last year with the security presentation, but it is part of a longer term conversation that's been going on for a long time. Thank you. I just wonder if that was the reason to move it. I couldn't think of any other reason, but I just wanted to No, that, that was the reason. We have looked at that several times. Every time we have expenditure at the Wellington, it's a real decision making as to sure, how much do you invest. You know, we will spend what is necessary to try to provide a safe environment for students and staff for as long as we continue to need to use the Wellington. But we always have to be careful. Is it really necessary to move the office and do some other things? Other questions on any buildings and grounds? Um, just a clarifying question. Um, I noticed that um, there were a number of carpet replacement lines in the fiscal year 08 budget, but none of those are being carried forward. And I just want to sort of confirm that um, is there a philosophical, some philosophical shift to wanting to move carpet replacement issues from this point on into the capital budget. My recollection is from the capital budget request that um, that's something that, that in the future we, we may be trying to do through the capital budget rather than through the through we, our limited funds for buildings around. We have it in the capital budget for the current year, fiscal 08 for the Butler School. There's a large amount to do a total replacement. Right, All these on. little amounts for $5,000 that have been in there basically was patchwork, mm -hmm. just taking isolated areas that were worst case. And Bob and I realized after a while that we were losing ground here. The carpet replacements in a lot of these schools were needed to be total replacement by building. So we will be coming back to capital budget with additional requests to go to the Wittenbrook and Burbank. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm guessing that an override vote might actually help with carpet repair because if you want to take up the carpet, you have to take up the tax first. <laughs> oh, man. You worked that out. Oh. <laughs> Raising tax. <laughs> Mr. Bow, you yeah, have another question. Um, talk about what the uh, new HVAC units will do for us budget wise. I mean, it'll decrease the maintenance and the operating costs and yes. the fuel even too. If you look at page 31.2, which is the FY07 expenditures, last year's actual expenditures compared to budget, you see two lines that are drastically over budget. One is the burners line where we budgeted 36000 and spent 56000 and we had a $20,000 deficit. But another account that has been a constant problem has been the HVAC line, where last year we budgeted 77000 and spent 143000 We're in deficit by 66000 And half of that 143000 was at the high school, 71000 out of 143000 So when we do install the remaining HVAC units and come back with the 2010 budget, I expect to see some savings in this line rather than the continuous annual deficit. Um, we hope to have that installation done this summer or into the early fall before the heating system season is required, but I'm always cautious about reducing the budget line until something else is accomplished and we start to see the results. But I definitely will come back to this account for 2010. Okay. Would, but would you guess it would be for, say, the HVAC sale of this chair here? I... Way down? So I, I can't the offer a guess at this point. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. I mean, the, the bills that are being paid at the Wellington for this week and last week are being charged to the HVAC. How are the decisions made during the um, request to come in and... Like if there's under the Chenery Middle School to install an air conditioner. I'm sorry, on page 31.4, 202. Install air conditioning in room 202. I imagine it's a blistery hot room of some sort. I'm not sure where it is. But I'm just curious as to how the decisions are made to. That's where we put those two columns in there. It'd say principal's priorities and supervisor buildings and grounds priorities. That's uh -huh. Bob Martin. And we asked them to give us their priorities. I can look at the two. And end up melding the two choices okay. and try to fund the highest priorities, which for both the principal and Bob was the door hardware replacement at the middle school and hand dryers in the bathroom. So we which have them in the ones out here, which are very successful and yeah. save us on paper towels and are very energy efficient. It's the ones that sound like a jet plane taking off. Um, it's, it's a good 
it's so a great we want idea to have them prioritized. That's what it looked like, but I wasn't 100% sure how the decisions were made. So right. it would look a little different. But. Room and 202 must be the lower school office, and they're there in the summer, and that's why they're looking for air conditioning? Is that what it is? I'm not certain about that, but I can check. Right. The whole building has And the control. drip pan over the server also, we even can chimed in on that as a way of keeping the server from mm -hmm. yeah. going out. <laughs> so that was funded. Other questions on buildings and grounds? Moving on to custodial services, page 32.1. We have a very low number of custodians compared to other school systems because we do contract out at both the middle school and high school and have been doing so for years. Uh, we are in the second, we're currently in the second year of a three-year contract, so for FY09, we are still under the terms of that contract. So the contract cleaning lines down near the bottom of that page are exact numbers. Uh, it's nice to have a multi-year contract where you know exactly what you're going to be paying for the following year. For the most part, we're level funding the supplies, going up slightly, but not much. Um, and the staffing is, is level funding. A slight increase at the middle school to reflect the fact that we have a 0.5 rather than a 0.35 custodian um, at this building. It helps out with the cafeteria at lunchtime. And any other questions? Custodial overtime? I'm sorry? There wasn't any custodial overtime? We never used to have a custodial overtime account. It always used to be charged to the maintenance overtime line. Uh -huh. And we decided that for reporting purposes I should have one. We put a lot of new accounts in with the implementation of the Immunis financial software so that we can more closely align our expenditures with the DOE end of year financial report. We just now this year are starting to charge against that. It's just a matter of breaking out uh, in payroll which way the overtime is going. Moving on to utilities. And we start with electricity. And um, it is my unfortunate position to have to say that we need to, we will need to increase the electricity account because I built these projections on an assumption that the rate increase coming from the municipal light department would be a flat 50% for all categories. And I understand that the rates that were voted last week by the Belmont Light Board had different rate increases for the different categories of use. And the large municipal rate, the ME rate, was which the high school in general uses, that increase was 54%, which is close enough to my projection for me to be comfortable with. However, the real backbreaker is the MB small municipal rate, which our four elementary schools and the school administration building uses, that increase was 88%. Hmm. I know. The Light Board had the opportunity to have an across the board 52% increase. I expressed my position to the director, but they chose to go with the individual rates, kind of each floating on its own bottom. Um, so I will have to go back and I'm estimating that the additional cost here is going to be in the range of forty to $50,000. I'll come back to you at a later meeting with that adjustment. I would like to actually get the first couple of bills if I could, the January and February bill, to verify that, to make it more accurate. On the fuel oil, um, we are converting from fuel oil to natural gas at the Windbrook, and the budget actually led the conversion. We thought we would have it done in time for fiscal 08. However, we've had some problems with key span in terms of the connection, and we're still using fuel oil at the Windbrook. There's a temporary tank out behind the building at the entrance to the playground, which is still being used. Um, we do hope within a matter of weeks, but I've been saying this for four months now, to complete this conversion. It's a question of the a valve and the pressure coming to the school. We want to be extremely cautious, and we're working with the town building inspector to make sure that everything is the right to spec before we actually say go for it. So. There's no budget for the Windbrook and fuel oil, 
and there's a budget for it in estimated amount in natural gas. The fuel oil is a real quandary. Last year we had the advantage of part of a seven town collaborative, it's the town of Brookline that puts this bid out on behalf of seven towns, so we and the town departments here in Belmont are get the same prices off this. Last year they put the bid out with bid prices coming in in February and we actually knew and were able to make a positive adjustment and save some money in the 08 budget because the prices went down by 15%. We were in contact with the town of Brookline officials and asked when you're going to put the bid out and they said in the current market with the price of a barrel of oil at or approaching $100 they felt they can get a better price by holding off until later in the spring. So they're not going to put the bid out until after our budget has to be set. So we asked the town of Brookline, what are you budgeting for your increase? And they said they're adding back in 15% savings, basically going back to FY07 prices for FY09. So I did likewise here and I added in the 15% increase. I know this was one of the questions that the Warren Committee had on their list of questions for this morning's meeting in terms of how we're, what we're increasing this account by compared to what the towns and because Brookline puts the bid out, I just went by their lead. But this is, at this point, I really have to say a shot in the dark. Um, I, I'm astonished by the 88% increase in electricity because we had been told for, what, a, almost a full year coming up to the making of this budget to expect a 50% increase. Um, I'm just curious what other groups or businesses or municipal entities in the town are hit by this 88%. Is it a fairly large portion of the town, a small portion of the town? Do you have any idea? I don't at the moment. I'll have to ask the director of the municipal light department. Yeah, I'm just astonished by yes. this. But you said it's a municipal rate, right? So yeah, well, it wouldn't be for businesses, right? No so businesses. It's just us and the town departments. How the town departments are handling it in their budget, I don't know. Wow. Well, they're mostly I, small, I would think. They're, they're, they're small, right? so they would have the same MB rate. Chenery and uh, and the high school are the two biggest buildings in town. But right. everything else is, is a comparable size to the elementary school. The exactly. The elementary school, right. school administration yeah. right. So presumably the Homer building, the town hall, right. you know, all so of those So they're going up 88 too. Are hit by the same increase. <laughs> but just the town just the town municipal building. Wow. I'm, I'm just astonished. We knew, I mean, the, the overall increase that they needed was in the vicinity of 50%. Right. And we did know that a year ago when we built the FY08 budget. We didn't know until their consultant gave a report to their board back in December that they were thinking of adjusting the individual rates differently. And uh, the MD rate ended up being 88%. We were sticking with the 50%. Yeah. Yes, okay. Just curious. Why don't they charge as one one customer right, as opposed to with you know with one rate you know one gigantic meter even though it's physically six or eight different buildings um, rather than individual little buildings at different rates you know what I mean we we've been getting a break with the large municipal rate at the middle school and high school we've been on at those two buildings at what is called the demand meter where the, the rate for the actual kilowatt hours of usage is lower. But then they also add a demand charge because of such a large volume. And a demand charge means that they have to reserve a certain amount of electricity for us based on the single highest reading during the course of a month. Uh, they come in, read the demand meter, reset it, and it floats, never goes down for the month, month until they you know, take it again. Uh, that actually saves us money in the long run. It, it, the total cost of a lower kilowatt hour rate plus the demand charge is less than what we would be paying if the MB rate was applied to the Chenery and High School, especially now with the large increase in the MB rate. So. Anybody else? Um, the, getting ahead a little bit to uh, the issue of building rentals, I, I, I tried to, it looks as if you have a budget for an increase in uh, tuitions and rentals in the, in the revolving accounts. I guess I'm just wondering um, if at some point the administration have a recommendation for us either on 
uh, making changes in what we charge outside groups um, as a function of these uh, unanticipated, you know, and exorbitant uh, utility increases and or uh, other uh, other ways of helping offset the, their actual uh, impact on the buildings. I, I bring this up because looking at your breakout down of costs per pupil, um, you know, the one at, at the very bottom of 33.3, at the high school, the amount is you know five hundred and twelve dollars per student versus a low of one eighty nine at the Winbrook. Now, obviously, the Winbrook has a an active KED and uh, after school program, but it just uh, does point out also the extent to which our budget carries, um, I think, a lot of utility costs that end up benefiting benefiting other groups in town. In that, that high school is open essentially nineteen twenty hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, well, at sixteen for for um, for the rest of the world, but also for the custodians and the like. So it just it just calls into question how much we can subsidize with these increases coming along, um, the increases, how much we can insulate some of the other uses of the building, no pun intended, from the increased cost of utilities and, uh, and heat. Well, I think we we will be coming back with a recommendation to increase building rentals. We've been conducting a survey of surrounding towns. The people in the business office who have been calling around said that they have it almost complete now. Mm -hmm. uh, I did want to see what these rate increases of electricity were first, yeah. so we know what to make an adjustment on. Great. Well, as we, as we know, too, the, the after school boards in particular have been hoping that we can give them information about the cost increases as soon in the process as we can so they can set their tuitions accordingly. Right. But it will be coming. At the high school, do you have a feeling for what fraction of electricity is used by non-school groups, including, say, the rec department programs? Is that significant or just noise? That's hard to say. Um, the rec department has extensive use of the pool. I don't know. It's hard to isolate how much electricity is used by that. Um, we do receive a substantial lease payment from the Lexington Chinese School was in there every Sunday, and we paid the utilities and the custodians out of that. And that's been going up the last couple of years. We had a big increase a year ago on that when we first saw utility costs going up. Um, I, I couldn't venture a guess on that, John. I'm just wondering more the set of rec, rec programs and other non school things besides the ones that we explicitly get money for. Right. The ones we just host, you know, uh, uh, continuing ed and things like that. You right. know, they, continuing ed is part of you know, that's ours, ours too. That's ours, ours. right. Ours. That's us. Um, I was just looking at the expenditures from 2007 and looking at, you had done this comparison of Wellington and Windbrook in terms of uh, maintenance, and so I was thinking about in terms of energy expenditures and, and uh, utility expenditures, it's looking at Butler and Burbank, and there's a huge difference between those two. Is that really the difference between natural gas and fuel oil, or is there, some, or is there a difference? I mean, there's a little bit of difference in electricity and some other things, but the biggest difference is, you know, about $17,000 in natural gas at Burbank and 52, almost $53,000 in fuel oil in Butler. Mm -hmm. Is that really all pricing difference, or is one building better insulated than the others? I mean, I'm just trying to... That's where the difference is. Uh, I couldn't cite the reasons for it, I think. It's just so big. The Burbank is... It's a fairly well put together school. Uh, the Butler is a slightly older building, mm -hmm. probably not as energy conserving. Um, and we, again, the natural gas, I'm just getting to that actually, we're enjoying the results of a very good price by being part of the ETCO collaborative bid for the supply of natural gas. We pay key span for a distribution charge, but our cost at the city gate, as it's called, has been going down considerably for the past two years because of being part of a collaborative bid. So it's just it's it was such a striking. It is striking. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that myself it. until you just pointed it out. Right. First always leaves the windows open too. <laughs> 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 they wear a lot of sweat. And, you know, hopefully we'll see that same result at the Windbrook for next year when we finally get that converted. Also, Burbank uses twice as much water as Butler. Seems kind of odd. Bruce leaves the water on. <laughs> no, but Christine leaves the water on. Bruce oh, leaves the windows. Okay. Moving right along. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I said what I wanted to say on natural gas about the collaborative bid. We, we are seeing a considerable savings <coughs> in that. Hopefully that will continue. Um, the water and sewer budgets are coming down because a year or two ago we anticipated large increases that didn't pan out. Plus, it's also that we're saving some water as part of the ESCO project. There was some water conservation measures put in. Um, so we're just gradually lowering the budget to meet the reality of what gets charged. Um, and the telephone account is basically just trying to keep up with expenditures. We've been having an extended use of Nextel phones for security reasons, giving them to uh, principals, assistant principals, maintenance workers, custodians, that we did not have the amount of distribution two or three years ago. But they've been extremely important for security reasons. And we just charge us to the telephone account. We've broken them out into their own account now so we can track them better. Any other questions on any of the utility pages? Oh, I was wondering how uh, Elizabeth's water use is just say less than 10 percent than uh, high school water use. Is it because of um, middle school? What? No, I was wondering if it's because like, the middle school people are always in class or like they're moving to another class, whereas high school kids are up, like, they have threes in the world? I don't know. Could be a function of being a newer building. Uh, because being a new building, the uh, sinks and all the laboratories uh, are spring activated where they cannot be left running. You use them and then they shut off automatically. Whereas the high school, being an older building, they could be left on. Right. Uh, I don't know why the high school water usage is as high as it is. Some people wonder if it's connected with the pool. Well, yeah. it's so connected yeah. with the pool only when we do repairs on the pool and have to drain it and then refill it. And those years was not, none, none of those, that did not occur in fiscal 07. It occurred a couple of years ago, but it didn't occur in 07. Probably the high school kids take showers and middle school kids, I, I imagine, don't, don't take showers. That's yeah. Any, oh. but as I understand, um, well, taking showers, I don't know about other sports, but uh, after swimming, like only, I don't know, like only the shower goes on for like five minutes. Yeah, that and could be. It's only a season, and I just didn't see how the yeah. difference is so Yeah, big. it's an enormous difference. It is an enormous difference. Hopefully that will be corrected when we ever do the high school master class. Other questions on utilities? Okay, yeah. moving on oh, to... Gary, excuse me, I'm going to put you on the phones. Yes. Any idea why the middle school phone is so much more expensive? Is this the transfer to the... Yes, yeah. transfer to the new system. But you're budgeting for another 10000 next year still? Is it, I thought the transfer's not done. Well, it's done, but these are the ongoing charges. So we want to keep up with the ongoing charges. So Give us another year worth of tracking on that before we start making adjustments. That's just so much. That's five times more than, almost yeah. five times more than the elementary school phones. But there's several well, there's, people here. Right. The elementary schools have very few phones. There are only a couple in the offices. Yeah. Right. Middle school basically has right. a phone in every classroom. Mm -hmm. It has more extensive phone connections than even the high school. So. No, I expect it to be more. I'm just surprised it's going up another 10 for next year. But. Right. Moving on to page 34, we're into the building administration. Page 34.1 is the composite of six pages which follow it, um, which is why you don't see any specific account numbers on page 34.1. It's our 10 principles and system principles, six principles and two assistants at the Chenery, two assistants at the high school plus all the clerical staff and other personnel. Um, going building by building is, is not much to say. It's all the staffing has been level staffed and all the non salary accounts are for the most part level funded. The equipment accounts, we do have a separate page in the budget. The next tab in the budget is called supplies, tax, equipment repair, equipment in general repair. And under that, there are green dividers 
if you go past the second green divider, you see the list of all the equipment being requested for every account in the budget. I know this was several questions that the Warrant Committee was asking on the list for this morning. So, for example, the first equipment request for the building administration is in the Butler for $5,250. And if you look at that uh, page, start with the Burbank and then the Butler, and under the building administration, it's 10 cafeteria tables. The Butler is also asking for equipment through the elementary instruction program and the music program. This is not numbered, but the next tab is labeled Supplies, Techs, Equipment, and General Repairs. I'm sorry, you don't have it. No, you, sorry. you need a complete budget book for this one. It's not in the handout. No. I can provide that to you if you want. That's a good question. Okay. And again, we level funded equipment across the board. So these were most critical needs. We tried whenever possible to fund any furniture request because our furniture in a lot of our schools, student desk, cafeteria tables, has been you know vast need of replacement. And so any principal that asks for a piece of furniture, we try to have that survive the cut of level funding. And then we have basically the, the Wellington, the Windbrook, and then the middle school and high school. The middle school and high school have supply accounts, which are general supplies for instruction. Um, the elementary have the instructional supplies in, uh, in their instruction page, which is back on page four, which we covered the last meeting last week. Uh, the instruction for the high school, though, is in the principal's account, principal's budget. Everybody taps into this, all the various departments. This is the basic copy paper for all the various copiers and any other general supplies. <coughs> We do have a new account in the high school building administration only because I had no idea where to put this. The last account is the other vocational tech school tuitions. Mm -hmm. And again, this is to pay the tuition for a student attending Norfolk Aggie. <coughs> Just could not figure where else in the budget to put this. It's not special ed tuition, and yet it is tuition out. So I put it in the high school administration. Any question on any of the six pages for building administration? Just one comment. The $20,000 you had budgeted for that, that's still less than per pupil cost of Minuteman by a lot. Yes. Yeah. But then there's another seven to $8,000 for transportation. Oh, on top of the 20 here? Yeah. On top of 20. I was on that transportation. Yes. What's Minuteman? 23? 23. Yep. Scott? A um, question, actually, I, for Dr. Holland, um, looking at the um, school resource officer at the high school, I, I note that uh, I'm reminded that, that we pay half the salary. Um, does this per do we have any sort of supervisory control or evaluative control over the position, or is that, uh, or, or is any evaluation or supervision undertaken by the police department? Uh, We're paying half the freight. Do we get yeah. half the say as to how the person's doing? Uh, well, I mean, he, uh, inter the, the person that does as school resource officer interacts regularly with uh, the high school uh, principal and to a lesser extent with uh, some of the other principals. <coughs> uh, uh, I, I, since he is a member of the police department, I would presume that he is evaluated as are all their people by their own staff, not by us. Okay. Though I, I think if there's any concerns we have, I certainly would uh, be pleased to share those with the uh, chief, and I think the chief would go willingly accept uh, and, and receive any such suggestions. It seems to me that it's going very well, basically. Yeah, no, I, I didn't ask us any immediate concerns. It's yeah. just more a question of if you're paying you know, for that. having a person's services, you, you know, the evaluation you just, uh, just uh, should come at some level. Well, I, I could talk to Mike about that. I could talk to the chief about it. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an idea. I mean, certainly uh, providing some input in terms of how uh, the role is seen and how the person performs it would be useful, I presume, to, to the chief. But uh, uh, I don't see us as performing any evaluation on it as yeah. much as providing input to it. Okay. Very good. And my, my other question is just sort of a bookkeeping question. I, I see that the good news in, in data processing contract services at all six schools is that that's, it's, it's level funded again this year. That's zero. That's zero. But I'm wondering why we have. But sorry, I can drop that account in the budget book next year. Okay, I'm just wondering. I, I didn't know if there was a carryover from an old system or whether Munich yes. required you to have one in the new, in the new yeah. system. But okay, it's a carryover from when at one point Liam Can used to 
prorate the Redeker charges across the individual buildings. Okay. And then he found that, that was more cumbersome than it was worth, so he just pays those out of his tech budget. Great. Well, for the record, I, I like it when even antiquated lines stay in um, for, a, a, for a few years just to show that they were there at one time, but it looks right. like we reached the point where, that, where we can save a little ink on those yes. six lines. Right. Yes. Um, I know that um, at, at the high school, the installation of smart boards is um, like encouraged and like forced, I just, should I say. Um, I was wondering if it's in any of these budgets, the smart boards. The smart boards would be in the technology budget, which we covered two meetings ago, not in this one. Uh, it would also be listed, and if you don't have the entire budget book, you don't have this page with you also on the equipment page. So if there are any being purchased, mm -hmm. you okay. can check on that and get the equipment page to you. Okay. Just okay. Uh, su a suggestion of, uh, from that. I also talked to a few of my um, peers, and we were thinking maybe um, instead of, well, I'm not trying to question, <laughs> but um, instead of smart boards, uh, because if we were to use smart boards, we do need projectors. And I know we only have um, limited numbers of projectors at the high school right now. We need to move it around the classrooms in order to have it projected. Uh, so I was wondering if the projector purchase or installation is as much or, like, I, I don't know what the fraction is. Again, this is all through the technology budget. When Dr. McCann was here and we reviewed his budget two meetings ago, he indicated that the request he received from all the principals and directors totaled about $800,000. He cut that down to $400,000 and asked us for that amount in the budget. We level funded him at $276,000. So we are going forward with computer requests, and, which includes some smart boards, some projectors. But there's a lot of things that were requested that we simply cannot fund. But for every $3 that was requested, we can only fund one one out of three dollars. Uh, this is an area where we hope to receive some uh, assistance from the Foundation for Belmont Education or other, other funding sources. Thank you. I agree totally with your sense about their importance and the need for them. It's just a matter of not having the budget funds to yes. give them priority. Anything else at the table? Would you like to take over there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just so I understand, any child that wants to go to Minuteman or to a farm school, are we mandated to send them there and pay the costs? If they go to Minuteman, it's part of the assessment which comes into town and is voted as a separate line item at town meeting. If they go to a agricultural school, which basically has a program that is not offered by Minuteman, yes, by state law, we're required to pay both the tuition and the transportation. But for any child that wants to go to Minuteman, they, they may go? Yes. With that. Now, with the, with the large tuitions that we pay, the travel costs for the agricultural school, yeah. is anybody trying to talk them out of it? <laughs> 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 I mean, I can we, can no, you can't that? really do that. There's, yeah. there's, there's, actually, in the 20 years I've been here, there's only been two students that have done that. So it's, it's a pretty rare. The, no, the agricultural, but the right. Minuteman is a very expensive program. Well, it's, it's, it's you know, uh, yeah. typically those programs used to be offered in the public schools, right. and they got to be such low incidence courses that they decided then to have a regional school. The problem, one of the problems is the state has too many regional vocational technical schools, and a number of them are really under-enrolled which then raises the cost per student. And that's why the cost is so excessive, particularly for the one that we use. It, so are there others that are close to Complex? Uh, Shawsheen uh, in where, Bill Ricca. It's the edge of Bedford and Bill Ricca is, uh, is less, and it's a, it's a terrific program. Can uh, we get in their network instead of the uh, to get it out, uh, yeah, we'd have to have a two-thirds vote of the board. Right, of all the other towns, of the, the, it, of the 16 towns yeah, in the board. Two -thirds of the Minuteman board, board. not right. this board. I thought it was, I, I, is it unanimous? I thought it was, I always thought it was under the impression yeah. it was unanimous. It's yeah. extremely yeah. rigid. Yeah. 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 She's well, a, she's, a, she's, a, she's the, the Warren board. Committee at one time, a number of years ago, looked into that, and it was just going to be so difficult. And one of the reasons that the other towns don't want to let you out of it is because if they let us out, right. their costs right. would go up. Yeah, the fixed costs so, go up. And the this is a place where membership does not have its privileges. Right. right. It's the Neswick of uh, <laughs> Motex. Yeah. All right. 
I, I, philosophically, too, I mean, the, 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 this is probably worth mentioning once a year, is that the whole movement in public education is toward greater choice for students and empowering students and parents as compared to um, maintaining a so-called local monopoly for public schools. Uh, we, in fact, were members of the school choice program uh, for a few years, tried that at the high school level. Um, it brought us in some revenue, but there were a lot of other attendant costs that we hadn't really anticipated. We did not make the decision to continue in school choice. I doubt that this budget will include any school choice. But more generally, um, the, the ability of students and parents to decide where they're going and to assign those costs to the town where they live is going to increase over time. Less in Belmont because we do a very good job of maintaining a high level of satisfaction here. But that's, that's the general trend. And, and the, the state is committed to giving choices to, uh, to parents and to students to migrate where they think their needs are best served. Next. Yeah. Moving on to page 35, which is the central administration. And this program pays for the salaries of three administrators, Dr. Hall and myself, and the human resource manager. I mentioned previously that the assistant <coughs> superintendent salary is on the curriculum development and staff development pages. And also the clerical staff working for the superintendent's office, the business office, and the human resource office. The non-salary accounts, uh, the two big increases, we have had this perpetual problem with the advertising and recruitment account where we're constantly having to increase that to catch up to expenditure and that's basically because we've been hiring an average of 50 teachers a year and when we can't get teachers in a specific subject, we have to keep on placing the ads in the Globe and other places and using Apple Talk now, we have a computerized system. But this is very expensive advertising, and uh, we every year seem to exceed that budget and slowly try to creep up to match expenditure. The other large increase is in the central admin financial software contract, which is going from six thousand dollars to eighteen seven, and that's the service fee for Munis, as compared to the six thousand dollars, which used to be the service fee for the old SNS software. And, Believe me, it's worth every penny of the increase <laughs> in terms of the capability of the financial software. Are there any questions on the central administration page? Uh, yes. Quick, oh, go ahead. No, I, um, central administration superintendent salary under budget of FY07, there were three people budgeted for that. Does that mean that you've lost two people in your office? No, I, I, no we're, we're breaking this out. We created some new accounts again yes. with the installation oh. of units because yeah. when I have to file the end of your report, I have to file the expenses of my office, including my salary, separate from Dr. Holland's office and separate from the HR office. So under the old SNS software, we only had one account that all three administrators were charged to and one secretarial account, and I always had to do the hand adjustments at the end of the year. So with the new chart of accounts, we created new accounts for each of our offices, and we now have the ability to charge directly to them. Thank you. So the, the 5.7 under budget, the FY07 totals. totals the five lines next to it in FY08. That is correct. Okay. Notice across the bottom, it's 8.7 yeah. all the yeah. way for three straight years. I, uh, uh, you already uh, dealt with the, uh, the increase in the financial software contract documents, so I'm a little surprised. Um, that since we're new, now using Munis, that the budget for OA, you know, so reflects um, the lower costs that were part of the SNS system. Are we going to be over um, on that in terms of the actual for for the current fiscal year? Yes, we will. Okay, but this th this will be a one-time increase uh, effectively. Uh, in other words, we we will expect that the, the, there'll be some something closer to eighteen twenty thousand dollars going yes. forward, rather than additional increases as more modules come online or something. No, it should be in that eighteen seven vicinity, you know, ongoing now. If there's no further questions on central administration. I move on to legal services. Um, we're increasing that account by $2,500 because in the past with the contract for our current firm, Stone and Chandler and Miller, that's been their usual increase. However, we have extended the previous contracts and I know the school committee is looking into that. Mm -hmm. So, and the $30,000 for legal settlements pays for anything outside of the base fee for, for legal services. 
So there's no questions on that. I'll move on to the school committee. Just a, a, a quick note that this may be a category in which, um, if we decide to go away from a retainer basis, particularly if for a year upcoming in which there won't be much collective bargaining, this may be an account for FY09 where we can see some large budget reductions. That's which might be helpful to know in terms of offsetting other stuff. That's correct. School committee, there is no salary for any staffing for school committee clerical. It's not been for years. And well, we'll fund it again. We will fund it again. <laughs> we'll continue to show that account there. because I think it's important <laughs> to know Thank that you. that's <laughs> right, right across the board. Uh, and for the most part, the non salary accounts are level funded, a slight increase in the dues for the various school committee associations to catch up with what we're being charged. Moving on to contractual allowance. And the contractual allowance serves two categories. One, there's an amount in for contracts that are under negotiation, where when we first started putting the budget together, we did not have a settlement, which would be the Ask Me contract and Unit D. It also pays for all staff members who are not under a collective bargaining unit in terms of their raises, which would be the merit increases given to the administrators, the merit portion of the curriculum directors, and assistant principals, and all the list of non-bargaining folks that you uh, voted later <coughs> in the spring. And we put in a blanket amount for degree changes. Uh, we track this every now and then, and the, full, and the amount that we put in, $40,000 actually, is pretty much what we find. During the course of the year, we budget a teacher at an M, master's degree, step five, and between the time we set the budget and the time we come back in September, they picked up a few additional places <coughs> and they slide over to the M plus 15 column. So this is the only place in the budget where we have the latitude to pick up that extra cost going across the column. Going on to the fringe benefit page, and actually see some good news. <coughs> the uh, changes in the, as a result of negotiations and the split from 90-10 for the HMO to 80-20 for most of our bargaining units when we put these numbers together. Uh, we are seeing a decrease in the health insurance. Uh, first time I've ever been able to say that. Uh, some of the other accounts like workers' comp is going up in the Medicare tax. The Medicare tax is at 1.45%, which is paid for both by the employees and the employer. It's a matching 1.45%. So as our total payroll goes up, our Medicare tax goes up. Uh, that is slightly underfunded for the current year, and I'm trying to do the catch-up as well as project what additional amount we need for 09. Uh, we are charging back to the school lunch revolving account. We are also 